All right, chapter 27, Empire and Expansion, 1890 to 1909. Let's get started. All right, so these key points are somewhat simplified, what we talked about earlier this week in class. But the United States is coming of age in an era of imperial growth. It's the age of imperialism. And what we talked about in class was that this is sort of global competition. And there's a fear that uh, emerges from that. And the fear is that if one does not expand, they will therefore expire. In addition to that, we talk about imperialism. It's not just conquest. We're not talking about colonies necessarily. We're talking about the extension of influence. And that influence can take various forms, whether it's social, political, economic, or military influence. And as a whole, America and Americans did support this. That said, there are some pretty serious challenges to this traditional uh, belief in imperialism that are emerging, mainly in the anti-imperialist league. And they're going to use some pretty traditional um, arguments to support what is now going to be seen as a pretty progressive idea. There is a belief in this concept of American exceptionalism, and it certainly is a, an underlying motivator for expansion and imperial growth at the turn of the century. It's a belief that is central to American political culture since the revolution, that Americans have a unique mission among nations to spread freedom and democracy. Now we'll see that there are other reasons for expansion as well. Uh, the desire for overseas markets, for example, new products and a new place to sell manufactured goods to, this idea of a, of a safety valve to relieve the pressure of labor and violence associated with that, as well as agrarian unrest. Americans also are feeling emboldened, as you can see here. The population is growing significantly. Uh, the economy is doing very well, and we have this really strong productive capacity. We have this real mission to spread Christianity. Uh, Josiah Strong's our country. It's possible future and its present crisis inspired missionaries to travel to foreign nations. We'll see missionaries going to Hawaii in the 1820s, for example. There's also a real aggressiveness to American foreign policy, and a lot of that is driven by our technological growth and change. And so Captain Alfred T. Mayen's 1890 book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, really advocates for a strong Navy. And he says that if you can control the waterways, then you can control the world. And as I said before, there is a fear that if we do not expand, we certainly will be overtaken and therefore expire. Here is Alfred T. Mayen, great haircut, might I add. And this is the Great White Fleet, which actually sails a little later. It's like 1908, 1909, uh, where these ships do uh, travel around and demonstrate American military power. Notice that they are gilded in gold and painted white for obvious reasons. And speaking of military interest, of course, we have a desire to place bases around the world. This is an overhead shot of Pearl Harbor, which you can see is quite protected. And it's also a deep water harbor, so modern naval vessels can dock there. All right, think back to 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine, that statement that opposed European intervention and colonization in the Western Hemisphere. We're going to see now Latin America become a real significant interest for the United States at the turn of the century. And Secretary of State James G. Blaine's big sister policy reflects that economic interest in which he encouraged Latin American countries to open their markets to America. Of course, we have conflict if, the, if we feel the Monroe Doctrine is being violated, there's a you know potential for a serious conflict at least. And that was almost the case here with a border dispute between British Guiana and Venezuela. When gold was discovered in that contested region, this issue kind of came to head. And Secretary of State Richard Olney warned Great Britain that if they had gone to war with Venezuela, that they would in fact be violating the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and Britain is going to kind of disregard this warning, and that will cause President Cleveland to threaten war. Now, either fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you look at this, Great Britain had their hands full with other European conflict, and so they sort of let this issue fade. And what follows is known as the Great Reproachment. It's the reconciliation between the United States and Britain. And moving forward, as you can see, this post was from 1918, so just after World War One. Moving forward, we have sort of resumed this traditional bond with our former parent state. Let's review the different types of influence in Hawaii. The social influence of the Christian missionaries bringing Christianity to the native Hawaiian peoples in the 1820s. We have some political leverage, I suppose, being exercised here by the State Department in the 1840s, warning other countries to stay out of Hawaii. In 1887, we have some military influence as the U.S. secures the right to build a naval base at Pearl Harbor. Let's think about this tariff and the economic and political tie and influence as well. Uh, the McKinley Tariff did affect sugar imports as Hawaii was not American territory.
territory. And so many wealthy American planters, such as Sanford Dole, begin to really push for annexation. And Queen Lili Wogalani, the last queen of Hawaii, resists this. But by 1893, Americans were able to overthrow the queen. And while it does take some time, Hawaii eventually is annexed. Here is Sanford Dole. I don't know what he's got going on with that beard. But his name and his legacy live on. Speaking of the tie between economics and politics, in 1895, the Cuban insurrectos are burning sugarcane fields, and their hope was to drive Spain out of Cuba. The Spanish Empire, which you might recall from the first period, was at one point quite powerful and impressive. Well, they're really in decline by the turn of the century. Uh, the other hope is that the United States might move in and assist Cuba uh, in fighting off this European oppressor. I mean, that's what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. And doesn't the United States, with their American exceptionalism, don't they support free peoples? They certainly do. And in fact, Cuba Libre becomes one of the uh, war cries for the Spanish-American War. Uh, now, obviously, if you are a, an imperial power and one of your possessions is in rebellion, you're going to do whatever you can to put that down. And the Spanish sent in General Valeriano Weiler to basically restore order. And he used reconcentration camps to bring guerrillas out of the you know, jungle fighting that they had been involved in and sort of round them up. Unfortunately, the conditions in these camps were deplorable and many people died. And so uh, American journalists, notably the Yellow Press and William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, they get a hold of this and in writing about it, they're going to actually drum up not just support for Cuba, but a lot of anti-Spanish sentiment. In 1896, Congress re recognized the revolting Cubans officially, uh, but President Cleveland opposed imperialism in general, as well as a war with Spain. And here is Weiler, nicknamed the Butcher, and you can see how he was portrayed by the press. We are going to look at this cartoon in class. In fact, we're going to do the hip analysis. So if you want to pause us and do that right now, go right ahead. Again, that is historical context, intended audience, purpose, and point of view. Now, I failed to mention before that there were American sugar planters in Cuba as well, and obviously the whole island is in disorder and chaos, and Cubans that are burning sugarcane fields, well, they're threatening American lives and property, as well as Spanish lives and property. And so the United States does send a ship down there to defend the interest of Americans and perhaps evacuate Americans, uh, but it does blow up, and the United States does blame Spain for this. Spain insists that it must have been an accident. Uh, it's not until 19, I think, 73 that the United States acknowledged that, in fact, it was an accident. In 1898, however, the United States did make a couple of demands to Spain, and they conceded to those demands, the first of which was ending the reconcentration camps, and the second of which was to uh, have an armistice with the Cuban rebels. Now, President McKinley, like Cleveland before him, opposed war with Spain, but the American people really wanted it. And there is a lot of uh, discussion about the impact of media on public opinion, and certainly we like to think that the yellow journalists may have swayed the American people or created this anti-Spanish sentiment. Now, in April 1898, Congress does declare war, and before going to war, they adopt the Teller Amendment, and as you can see, it says when the United States had beaten the Spanish, the Cubans would be free. And to say it another way, we would not take political control of Cuba after the war. Now, here's a headline from the day. And you can see clearly it suggested that the Maine was attacked. And remember, the Maine becomes a rallying cry for the war. The fighting against Spain actually begins in the Philippines, uh, and American naval ships will be in much better condition than the Spanish. In fact, they're modern. Uh, they are uh, state-of-the-art technology. The Spanish Armada is now antiquated. May 1st, 1898, Commodore George Dewey does attack and destroy the Spanish fleet at Manila. And there are German ships, it said in the pageant, that are kind of lurking just outside the harbor here, a potential threat to the United States. But fortunately, that blew over. By August 13th, American troops captured Manila with the help of 
Filipino rebels. Obviously, that's going to be uh, a point of concern down the road here as the Filipinos sort of assume that they would be liberated. Obviously, that's not going to be the case. Uh, this victory in the Philippines, however, does encourage Congress to annex Hawaii. It's a nice stopping point in route to Asia. And with, pos with the possession of the Philippines, excuse me, you can see just how close to China the United States actually is. Okay, so I'm pretty confident in saying that the College Board is not going to ask you to know much about the battles of the Spanish-American War. There's only two things on this slide that I want to focus on. This is sort of an overview of those battles from the book, but that said, the bottom point, if you take a look at that bottom point here, many more Americans were killed by tropical disease than they were by bullets, and I think the numbers are... 400 versus 4,000, as in 400 killed in battle, 4,000 killed from disease. That's something you should understand, you should probably know. But more importantly than that is this volunteer cavalry unit called the Rough Riders. This is one of, if not the most celebrated pieces of the Spanish-American War, the whole experience. They were volunteer cavalry, and they're organized by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, they're a rough and tough kind of group, obviously, as their name suggests, but they're made up of former cowboys and adventure seekers like Teddy. Um, and this image of this sort of cowboy gone, you know, freedom fighter, if you want to think of it that way, is going to be used to propel the Roosevelt presidency to to kind of establish his image as a president or something he can fall back on when he's president. Uh, their victory at the Battle of San Juan Heights is often celebrated, uh, very often misrepresented. Here they are, is a picture of them with Teddy in the center. I know that he had his own uniform made at Brooks Brothers. That's not cheap. Here is a nice uh, painting, I, su I suppose, of the Rough Riders heroically charging up San Juan Hill, although they did not have their horses. In fact, they walked up the hill, and plenty of cartoons about Teddy and this rough and tough cowboy kind of image will be used during his presidency and thereafter. Okay, so the real legacy of the Spanish-American War will be the acquisition of new territories and the emergence of the U.S. on the global scene. And with the Treaty of Paris in 1898, the U.S. secured Guam and Puerto Rico. Now, Manila had been captured the day after the war ended, and as a result of that, America agreed to pay Spain $20 million in compensation for the Philippines. Now, the decision to keep the Philippines is very controversial. In fact, an anti-imperialist league emerges directly following that. Now, expansionists in 1898, 1899 would argue that Americans have a duty as a, you know, a civilized and evolved nation to help the underprivileged people of the world. The anti-imperialists will start to call upon traditional arguments such as government by consent to argue against expansion. Despite divisions in public opinion, the Senate approves the treaty in February 1899. The Platt Amendment places restrictions on actual freedom of Cuba following the war. As you can see, they were not permitted to sign a treaty with a foreign power that would impair their independence, and they were not permitted to build up an excessive public debt. The United States would decide on both of those points whether or not the debt was excessive or the foreign power might impair their independence. The Platt Amendment also permitted the U.S. to intervene in Cuba's affairs to preserve its independence and maintain law and order as needed, and it also granted the United States this naval base at Guantanamo Bay. And so the war is very brief, it only lasts a few months, um, but as you can see here, John Hay referred to it as a splendid little war, and I think that tells us a lot about the way Americans were thinking at the turn of the century, the desire to enter into imperial growth, uh, and the global competition that goes along with that. It also reunited the North and the South, so there's a resurgence of nationalism, and it kind of repaired that broken relationship with Great Britain as well. So following the defeat in Spain, the Filipino people assumed they would be free. Remember, they did assist the United States in fighting against the Spanish during the Spanish-American War. Unfortunately for them, that was not the case. And this man here, Emilio Aguinaldo, did lead a rebellion which lasted about three years. So compare that three-year rebellion versus a three-month war with an, a European imperial power. Excuse me. Now, McKinley did appoint a Philippine commission in 1899 to set up a government in the Philippines, and William H. Taft will lead this, and it said the pageant that he genuinely liked the Filipinos. And so while you see the phrase up there, Little Brown Brothers, something that he said as probably being uh, absolutely degrading, I do think that it represents this belief that many had that imperialism would better the people that were now under the influence of the United States. McKinley used a policy of benevolent assimilation, which basically meant that the United States would help rebuild the infrastructure. He would develop schools with English as a 
second language and help build roads and bridges and so forth. The Filipinos don't like this and they obviously prefer full liberty over any kind of outside influence. Here's Taft, by the way. And take a look at this cartoon here and you can see uh, it's suggesting, as the title does, that the Philippines are really only a stepping stone to China. And so, again, this sort of raises concerns amongst folks that could be members of the anti-imperialist league who are questioning the true nature of American foreign policy. So, around the turn of the century, there are several outside powers that have established spheres of influence in China. And we're talking about Great Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and Japan. And obviously, the United States wants a piece of that action as well. And so, rather than try to establish their own sphere of influence, Secretary of State John Hay issues his open door note, which would effectively get rid of all spheres of influence and open up China to everyone. Now, while this is happening, there's a group of native Chinese who are absolutely opposed to any kind of outside influence, and they do uh, stage an uprising. They do kill hundreds of foreigners. Uh, many missionaries, uh, unfortunately, are killed in this uh, rebellion as well. And a multinational rescue force came in and stopped the rebellion. John Hay then declared in 1900 that the open door would include the respect of Chinese territory in addition to its commercial integrity. See Uncle Sam opening the door. All right, so winning a war will greatly help a president get renominated and reelected, and that certainly is the case for McKinley. He's acquired new territory, he's established the gold standard, and brought prosperity to the nation. Both of those obviously are sort of Republican goals and will win the favor of the big business interest in urban America. He also has Teddy Roosevelt as a vice presidential candidate, who of course is an imperialist and uh, loved by most Americans, I would say. And opposing them is William Jennings Bryan, the Democrat, the former populist candidate as well. He still is supporting the silver standard and now questioning imperialism in general, uh, something that was gaining in popularity with groups such as the Anti-Imperialist League. And take a look at this campaign poster. You can see the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. Again, arguing that imperialism will be bring about the betterment of the people who are now being influenced by the United States. And McKinley does win. You see he has, of course, northern support. Again, big cities, big business, big banking. Now, in September of 1901, McKinley was assassinated, which, of course, means that Roosevelt would become president. And he sets a new precedent, so to say. In fact, I, he's not the first president to act uh, on power that is not specifically listed in the Constitution, remember that Louisiana Purchase, but he did believe that the president should take any action in the general interest of the public, and that the president should be bold, and the president should have an agenda, and certainly that is something that we see presidents continue moving forward. Now, there are a lot of details in the story surrounding sort of how the United States acquired the rights to build the canal in Panama, uh, but there's one thing that we should probably focus on, and, and that is simply that once Panama was decided to be the best location, the United States did offer Colombia, which at that time, Panama was a possession of Colombia. It did offer Colombia money, uh, which they rejected because they felt it was too low. And immediately after that, or shortly thereafter that, Panama will declare independence and revolt from Colombia. And they do receive the recognition of the United States, and they do receive military vessels in the area to help secure this independence they just have. Acquired. And as a result of that, the United States will actually receive the rights to build this canal uh, and obviously take control of this you know, link between the two oceans. Construction of the canal began in 1904 and was finished in a decade at the cost of $400 million. It was an engineering marvel. Take a look at the size of the locks here. You can see just how colossal it actually was. Kind of mind blowing to think that we could build something that large uh, and that complicated and sophisticated uh, you know, 100 years ago. And here you can see sort of the elevation change that the canal actually accommodates for. Even cooler than that, though, I just saw that Lego has a working model of the Panama Canal you can buy. Sadly, it's not life size. If Latin American countries owe significant money to European countries, then they would eventually come and collect. And that would be possibly a violation of Monroe Doctrine. That certainly caused a lot of concern for Teddy Roosevelt and his administration. So to solve that, they used this preventive intervention, which is formalized in the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And it stated that the U.S. could pay off Latin American countries' debts to keep European nations out of Latin America. Now, Latin American countries did not like the Monroe Doctrine at all. Uh, this was often seen as an excuse for U.S. intervention in Latin America in general. Uh, and this will be 
Kevin Carter and Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy, you know, several cartoons out there you can see, where essentially the U.S. becomes the police force or police power in the Western Hemisphere. Here's a good cartoon I hadn't seen in a long time. And obviously Teddy would just speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, Roosevelt's a pretty interesting guy. He did help negotiate a peace between Russia and Japan. Japan went to war with Russia in 1904 after Russia failed to withdraw its troops from Manchuria and Korea. And Roosevelt broke a peace agreement in 1905 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now, neither side was really satisfied with the terms of this. Uh, the Japanese received no compensation for their losses in the southern half of Sackville Islands. And because of the treaty, the friendship with Russia waned, and Japan became a rival with America and Asia. Nonetheless, Roosevelt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Live free or die up there in New Hampshire. The Japanese population in California was increasing significantly, and that caused some concern. Obviously, we know from such laws as the Chinese Exclusion Act that there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment, specifically towards low-skilled workers in this country, and specifically on the West Coast. In 1906, San Francisco decided to segregate schools, and students who had Asian uh, heritage would be placed in a different location to make room for more white students. As a result of this and this ongoing tension, Roosevelt and Japan, they have this gentleman's agreement which schools will be desegregated, and Japan will agree to stop the flow of immigrants to the U.S. They do that by withholding passports. In 1908, the Wu Takahiro Agreement is made, and here the U.S. and Japan pledge themselves to respect each other's territorial possessions. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to email or just let me know in class tomorrow. Take care.